Tonight will be the last of our three special considerations going into Easter week. Uh, we looked at some of the words and activities of John, or of Jesus in John, over the last couple of weeks, um, out of John 13, 14, 15, and 16, as we've discussed his getting ready for uh, the Passion Week. Uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about his tremendous grace. Last week, we talked about his fantastic plan, and tonight we'll be talking about his power. So let's stop and pray, and we'll get started with our study. Thank you, Lord, for getting us to this point. Uh, we look forward to what you have for us tonight. We pray that you'll lead us as we look through this section and prepare our hearts even for Easter Sunday morning and beyond. We thank you. We pray that you would teach and you would lead tonight. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm sure that you by now have heard about the uh, terrific and horrible crash that happened in the Baltimore Harbor a couple of days ago. I don't think you could get on the news or any social media and not see this crash, the uh, seagoing cargo vessel Dali, which is uh, licensed in Singapore, uh, hit and took down the uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge in the Baltimore Harbor. It's a tragedy for a lot of reasons. Fortunately, the uh, pilot of the ship called out a mayday to the harbor before hitting the, ship, the, the bridge, knowing that he would likely hit the bridge. They had about two minutes to clear the bridge, and all that was left on the bridge were eight construction workers, six of whom are currently missing and presumed lost. It is quite a tragedy. Uh, not only is it a tragedy because of the loss of human life, but it's causing quite a bit of consternation for folks in that area. That bridge handled 31,500 vehicles a day, which is a lot. Um, also, without that bridge and with the blockage of the harbor, the port of Baltimore is shut down. It is one of the busiest ports on the eastern coast of the United States. It handles 40 million tons of freight annually, including the majority of the vehicles that are imported into the United States go through, uh, at least on the eastern side, go through the Boston or the uh, Baltimore Harbor. So it is a busy bridge and a busy harbor, and it's a mess. You watch the video of that happening, and it looks like that bridge just folded like a house of cards. It looks like the ship just blew on it, and it was gone. But that's really not the case. That ship, the Dali, is 985 feet wide, pardon me, feet long, 157 feet wide, and it weighs 117,000 tons fully loaded. That's 234 million pounds. That's big. It's bigger than our minds are just able to comprehend just by talking about it. That's a tremendous amount of mass heading at the bridge at nine miles an hour. Moving that ship takes a tremendous amount of power. It has four diesel engines, the largest of which is a two-stroke diesel engine that makes 55,630 horsepower. I know that we can't even comprehend that. I mean, 630 horsepower, that's one of those new uh, Dodge uh, uh, drag race cars that you can buy. 600. This is 55,000 630 horsepower, and that's one of its four engines. It also has an engine in the bow that runs a bow thruster. It's part of the steering mechanism. That engine that's only purpose is steering is 4,000 horsepower to basically run the power steering on the boat. And there are two additional diesel engines of 5,150 horsepower apiece that are nothing but generators for the amount of electricity that that ship needs to operate. With that amount of power, it can travel all the way to Sri Lanka, which is where it was supposed to go, at about 25 miles an hour all the way, regardless of the condition of the sea. But without that power, it's 234 million pounds of dead weight floating toward the bridge at nine miles an hour completely uncontrollable. You can watch the video and you can see the moment that the power cut off. And then you can see a few seconds later them trying to restart one of those diesel engines so that they would have power. And it started there for a second, just long enough to load into some corrections 
And then it cut out again, and those corrections aimed it directly at the bridge. With that power, nearly 66,000 horsepower, it could move agilely through the water and snake itself under the bridge, but without that power, it's just a tragedy. That's kind of a really good example of what life is like as a Christian. With power, we are remarkably effective. We can navigate through the rough waters of this life easily. Without that power, we're just dead weight waiting for tragedy. Now, like I mentioned two weeks ago, we talked about the tremendous grace of Christ. We saw that in the washing of the disciples' feet, and we saw that in Jesus' treatment of Judas. Last week, we talked about the tremendous plan of Christ, how He has a plan for us right now that is fantastic and incredible, and He has a plan for our future, and that He told us about this plan so that we would be prepared for it and not surprised by it, and so that we wouldn't miss it. Now, this week, today, and Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, we're going to put the final piece in, the tremendous power of God. It's presented in His grace. We see it in His plan. Now we're going to see His power behind this. Now, understand that the disciples had been with Jesus for a few years, and they had seen some powerful moments. They had seen Jesus heal lots of people. They had seen Him raise some folks from the dead. They even saw Him feed 25,000 people with one little boy's lunch, that was a lot of power. They had seen him use his power to take on the establishment and win. And this power had attracted both the adoration and the irritation of a number of Jewish and Gentile leaders. And he told us, as we looked in John 14 last week, he told us, that we were going to do even greater things than the things that he was going to do. He told us in verses 12 through 14, Truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and he will do even greater works than these, because I'm going to the Father. We talked about that last week. That's a pretty horrendous claim. We're going to do greater works? Are we going to raise more people from the dead? Well, no. We realized, based on the context and based on what Jesus came to do and what He's telling us He's going to do, is that we would be able to, in His power, once He is no longer with us, reach tremendously more people with the life-saving gospel than He did. We realized that when He was done here on earth, He had about 120 faithful followers. As many as 500, but 120 who were faithful. The first day that the Holy Spirit came to be with us, 3,000 followers, faithful followers were added. Many more things have been done in those lines since he has not been with us personally than when he was. And he tells us how that's going to happen in verse 13 and 14. He says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. We we really have to understand that. That doesn't mean if we say, I really want a new BMW in your name, amen, that we're going to get one. That's not what he's saying. Praying in Jesus' name is not some uh, magical uh, stamp of approval or some immediate financial boon to us. Really, the key comes in the second half of verse 13. I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Remember, Jesus' ultimate job when he was with us was to point to the Father. He was to be displaying to us Father God. That's, That's the work that he did while he lived with us and walked with us as a human, was displayed to us Father God. That's the most important thing to Jesus, is that we see and know God the Father and so therefore are saved. Praying in His name is kind of like having a power of attorney. I don't know if you've ever had a power of attorney or ever seen a power of attorney. The first time I encountered a power of attorney was when Wendy and I had been married about a year or so, and we decided to trade in her car that continued to have air conditioning problems. 
for one that did not have those problems. We decided we wanted a car that was a little bit bigger, maybe a little more grown up. We'd been married a year now. (laughs) We're going to buy us a four-door car now and one that is fully functional. Well, when we brought them our car to trade in, we had to sign a power of attorney that said that they could, on our behalf, process the title, that they could take it out of our name and sell it to somebody else and put it in their name. We had to sign a power of attorney. What in the world is this? What am I signing off to you people? And they said, well, just simply that if you yourself were willing and able, that you could go down to the Department of Motor Vehicles and you could sign this paperwork. But since you're not able and willing, you're asking us to do it for you. So we're going to act on your behalf. And if you looked carefully at the power of attorney, you would see that it was limited just to that. That on our behalf, somebody from the dealership could go down to the DMV and sign off. It's power of attorney. They couldn't do anything we didn't want them to do. But in our name, they could sign those documents. Jesus is saying that in his name, we can sign documents for him, as it were. But it's limited. It's limited to the things that, that he will do that will cause the Father to be glorified in the Son. It's as if, when we pray in his name, it's as if we're saying, Lord, we know that if you were still here with us in the flesh right now, this is what you would do. We are convinced that this is the thing that you would be doing. The thing that you would be using your power to do is this thing, because this thing that we are asking you to do will glorify the Father in the Son. When we pray that people will find Christ and get to know God the Father, and we pray in His name, we can know that He'll do it. Because that's what it says. That is the kind of thing that he would do were he here with us. That's within the scope of the power of attorney. Now, this matters because of what we're about to get into. He says in verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commands. Now, we're not going to dig into that concept deeply tonight. It's something that we've dug into before, but let's just look real quick at what he's saying. If we love him, that is, if we have agape for him, if we are pouring our lives out for him, even as he's poured our lives out for us, we will keep his commands. What are his commands? There are really three of, three of them that are listed in the writings of John very briefly. One is that we love one another, that we have agape for one another. We pour our lives out for one another. Two, that we love the Father, that we have agape for Father God and we pour our lives out for Him. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, that we believe. That's why John wrote this gospel. That's why John wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. That seems to be what Jesus is calling us to more than anything else that we believe. And believing in Him is more than just simply a head knowledge that Christ really did exist, that He really was born of the Virgin Mary, that He really did die on the cross and was, born, and, and was raised on Sunday, and that He ascended 40 days later. Yeah, I understand that. I have this cognitive belief. No, this belief is much more than that. It is a taking Him at His word with our lives. It's betting our entire life, both now and in the future and eternal life, betting our life on what he has said. And I've told you before, this is really all he ever asked Adam and Eve to do. When he said, don't eat from that tree, that fruit's bad for you, it'll kill you. All he really wanted him to do is take him at his word. He said it, we trust him, we move on. And the neat thing about taking him at his word is that the Christian faith is never blind. It's never just this kind of thing that can't ever be known or backed up. We have so much evidence, tremendous evidence for who he is and what he's done. Oh, we've talked about this so many times. We can completely and totally trust him. The leap of faith is not a leap across the Grand Canyon. It's it's a step across a threshold is all it is. 
And the more we get to know him, the less of a leap it is, and the easier it is to simply take him at his word. And that's all he's asking us to do, is keep his commands, which are to trust him explicitly, and as since we trust him, to be willing to pour our lives out for Father God, and because we're willing to do that, be willing to pour our lives out for one another. If we do that, he says... If you love me and you will keep my commands, and here's what will happen. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. We talked about that phrase last week, another counselor. It's very important. Plays into both his plan last week and to the power behind his plan, another counselor. That term uh, another is the Greek word allis. And it means another one of the same thing. The example I gave you last week was if, uh, if we go home tonight to have dinner and Lindsay gives us ice cream for dessert and it is the best ice cream we have ever had and we really want more of it and so we eat the entire half gallon and I say, I will go get another and I drive up to the store and get another one of the exact same thing so that we can eat another half gallon in the same night that's what this refers to. It is not another as in we didn't like this and we want a different kind. So I'm going to go get another one that's different. It is another of the same. What he's saying here is, I will give you another counselor. That is, I have been your counselor to this point. You are about to get another that is of the same substance. I'm going to give you a second one of the same thing, or I'm going to ask the Father, and He will give you this counselor, this spirit of truth that you will have forever. He will be with you forever. That's important because Jesus just said, I'm leaving. When another one comes of the same substance, He will be with you forever. And He is the Spirit of truth. Jesus is going to tell us here in a little bit, Well, actually, in the same verse, the world isn't able to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. And he's going to tell us in a little bit that the world will reject him, that they don't want that truth. I have to tell you, truth is what drew me to Christ in the first place. I mean, I grew up going to church with some regularity. Um, I was going to church pretty regularly as a teenager, even when my folks weren't. And I began to uh, be attracted to the things of Christ as a teenager and on into college, but it wasn't until my late 20s that I really began to discover that this is all true. I remember being 19-ish years old and thinking Christianity is pretty neat. It's pretty neat stuff. It's pretty cool. Nothing like hanging around a church. I mean, that's just really a special thing to be part of a, a nice church, a good church. But just the same, I thought to myself, People have been dying for this faith for 2,000 years. Millions of people will die this year for this faith. And at that point, 18, 19, 20 years old, I really hadn't encountered anything that I felt like was worth dying for. I mean, it's good stuff. It's really interesting. But I mean, I mean, I wasn't prepared to walk away. And I wasn't sure what, somebody I'd, what I'd do if somebody put a gun to my head. But is it really worth dying for? And then I begin to discover how true it is. That it really is true. That what this Bible says really did happen in the way that it says it. And it's verifiable as fact. And that absolutely blew me away. You know, the, one of the greatest evidences for the truth of the Christian faith is the changed lives of of the 12 guys we call the apostles, not Judas, replace him with Paul. The fact that their lives were so drastically transformed and that each one of them gave their lives for this truth. Chuck Colson, you know who he was, Chuck Colson. He was one of uh, President Nixon's right-hand men, and he went to jail for the Watergate scandal for a, a, a period of time. He said that going to jail for the Watergate scandal was one of the things that helped him to discover the truth of the Scriptures. Because he said 12 men clung to this truth with their lives, gave their lives for it, most of them around 30 years after it all happened. So you got 12 men claiming the same wild story as truth 
for 30, 40, in John's case, 60 years, giving their lives for it. He said, we couldn't have four guys hold to the truth, for th- told to a lie, I should say, for three days. If this really had been a lie, there's no way that these guys could have clung to it. It is absolutely, completely true. And when you begin to discover that Christianity is true, that's when it begins to be transformative in your life, and that's when it begins to become worth dying for. Hanging around the church and hearing nice things is great. But when the Spirit begins to reveal to you how true it is, that's when it becomes transformational. He says, the world is unable to receive Him because it doesn't see Him or know Him. The world does not see the Spirit of Christ, the Counselor. The world does not know the Spirit of Christ. And so therefore is uninterested in the truth, like that line from the famous movie, you can't handle the truth. Well, the world can't handle the truth. The truth of Christ is something that is totally abstract and foreign to them because they don't know the Spirit of God. I was reading today, as I was looking at some various things about Neville Chamberlain, he was the Prime Minister of England from 1919 until about 1940. He was active in politics and he was the Prime Minister there going up to World War II. And he had a really interesting concept about the Nazis. He could see the Nazi Party taking over Western Europe. But he refused to acknowledge the truth of what was happening with the Nazi Party. He refused to acknowledge the oppression that was coming. He refused to acknowledge what they were already learning about what the Nazi Party was doing to the Jewish people. He developed a political policy that he referred to as appeasement. It was the name of the policy, appeasement. And basically, appeasement came, to, came, uh, uh, it came down to uh, making concessions with the Nazi Party to avoid all-out war. How'd that work? Not very well. His policies failed before he even went out of office. By 1939, they were at war. I see our culture today seeing what sin is doing, what rebellion against God is doing. I see our culture seeing the destruction that's caused by these things. And they seem to be opting for a policy of appeasement. We're just going to give culture this one thing. We're just going to let them have this one thing. I mean, there used to be a time when spitting in public was considered totally against societal righteousness. But is it really that big of a deal? Nah, we'll let them have that. There was a time when swearing in public was totally against what was considered righteous. But is it really that big of a deal? We'll just, we'll let them have that. And on and on it goes until we get into some really depraved things. And we say, is it really that big of a deal? How people treat members of the same or opposite sex in public, is it really that big of a deal? Ah, we'll give them that. It'll keep us from having all-out war against sin. And it's not working. Here we are in all-out war. Now, I bring that up because I find that we often do that in our own lives. We, we know that there is truth. We know who truth is. But there's this battle inside of us between the carnal nature, the flesh, who we were before Christ, and, and, and what we know of is the truth. And we really don't want there to be an all-out war, so... We'll just give in. Is it really that big of a deal if I watch this show, if I read this material, if I listen to this information? Is it really that big of a deal if I partake of this chemical or whatever your thing is? Is it really that big of a deal if I go down to the casino and game there for the day? Is it really that big of a deal? I mean, I don't want an all-out war inside of me. And it doesn't work. What you are about to hear from Jesus is the power to overcome that whole thing. 
And it right, it's right here. You do know him. That is the other counselor. You do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. So Jesus is leaving. This counselor will remain with us and be in us. That word remain is the word abide or dwell that we read about so much in John 15 that we're not going to study tonight. We have studied it at length in the past that we are to abide with him, to dwell with him. That is to just hang out with him and be with him 24-7, 365, just being in a state of continual communion with Christ. Well, we do that via the Holy Spirit who dwells with us, abides with us. He remains with us. And He's not only with us, but He is also in us. He's going to talk about that more in a couple minutes. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans, that is. I'm not going to start this whole thing and then walk away and leave you on your own. Defend for yourself. I'm not going to leave you that way. I am coming to you. Hmm, that's interesting. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. That's really interesting because he just told us he was leaving and going to the Father. He wasn't going to be here anymore. But then he says, I am coming to you. In a little while... The world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Huh. That sounds a little bit confusing. Hmm. Remember the ten days between Easter and Pentecost? They met in an upper room because Jesus told them to. They were being obedient. They they waited in Jerusalem, just like Jesus said. They were being obedient. They decided to try to do some stuff. Because, you know, they'd read there in Psalms about how Judas was going to be vacating and there was gonna, somebody else was going to take his place of leadership. And so they decided maybe they'd fix that real quick. I mean, why not? They're not doing anything else. So they kind of looked through their guys and decided who would be best for this job. They had a couple of guys. So oh, it could be either one of them could take the place. You know what? Let's let God decide, they said. And so they grabbed their dice and they said, God... We've decided we're going to fix this real quick. And, uh, and so we really want you involved in this process. So we're going to give you two choices. Whichever one you think is best, God, that's the one we're going to go with. And they picked a guy named Matthias who you never hear about again. That's the kind of thing an orphan would do, right? Totally fending for yourself. Alone without Christ. Christ. Not seeing him. You can understand why they would, because he said he's going to the Father. He said he's not going to be there anymore. They got to take care of this on their own. I mean, really, haven't you ever felt that way? But there's this interesting thing that he says in verse 19. In a little while, you'll no longer, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. That would indicate that without him, they're not going to live. They're not going to have any power. But something's going to happen and then they will see him. And when they see him, then they'll live. And on that day, when they see him and they live, they will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. They'll be indwelled by the Father Huh. The one who has my commands and keeps them, we talked about that, is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me, we will love by my Father, we talked about that. And I will also love him, and that's when I will reveal myself to him. Here's interruption number four. I told you Jesus gets interrupted four times in his, in his talk with them. And here it is, Judas, not Iscariot. You might know him better as Thaddeus. That's the nickname we call him by. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord... How is it you're going to reveal yourself to us and not the world? Man, that's a good question. I'm glad he brought that up. I mean, if we were paying attention, we would have brought that up. We're so hung up on this whole, 
you're going away and we're still going to see you. Judas picks up on the concept that we're going to be able to see Jesus, but the world is not. Okay, Jesus gives him a straight answer, and I appreciate that in verse 23. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Oh. Now, the one who does not love me does not keep my words. The word you hear is not mine. It's from the Father who has sent me. Okay, so now it's beginning to make sense. If we love him, if we pour ourselves out to him, then we will know him personally, make our home with him. This is a a phrase that indicates that he will be in our hearts. He'll be within us. We'll be dwelling with him continuously if we have poured ourselves out to him, if we are agapeing him. But, but the one who doesn't love him won't keep his words. Well, that's pretty simple because what's he said to do? Well, we're supposed to believe and love the Father and love one another. So they're not going to do that. So they're not going to see him. So this is something that is specifically for those who are pouring themselves out to him. Now understand that the word that we hear when he comes to be with us isn't the word of Jesus, but it is the word of the Father who sent me, who sent Jesus. Now he says, verse 25, I've spoken these things to you while I remain with you. The implication there is, we've talked about this before, but you still don't get it, and honestly, I'm not really expecting you to get it at this point. You're just, it's not going to make sense. We've been talking about it, and you guys just aren't picking it up. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I've told you. Uh, Hayden is home for the week. It's uh, spring break from Northwest Nazarene University. And Lindsay is so glad he's home. I mean, you know, she misses her brother and all that, sure. But Hayden is really good at math, and Lindsay is struggling with algebra. And she has been setting aside math assignments to turn in late, waiting for Hayden to come and explain how this is done. Now, Wendy has explained how it is done. We have read the materials to explain how it is done. Addie has explained how it is done. Addie has even offered her videos online from Khan Academy, which is a great source, to explain how it is done. But for some reason, the only person who can adequately explain math to Lindsay, and it's been this way since she was in elementary school, learning the minuses, the only person who can adequately explain it is Hayden. Somehow, it just makes sense to her then. And she can sit there with Hayden at the kitchen table and papers spread everywhere and the two of them work on math problems all afternoon and they both seem to enjoy it and she gets the work done. Often Hayden over explains things. He had explained one particular equation to her that took about a page and a half and she's like, I don't think that's how I'm supposed to do it. And they got to looking at it, no, she's supposed to use the short form. He was getting into calculus and all this stuff and he's like, oh, oh okay, sorry about that. But when Hayden explains it, it makes sense to her. I kind of wonder if maybe the Holy Spirit isn't just a little bit like that. Now, Jesus has told them a lot of things. And they didn't pick any of it up. Which, I mean, is good. I relate to that really well because sometimes it takes me a minute. But he says, listen, the Counselor, the Holy, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all these things and remind you of everything I have told you. He's going to be the teacher and a good teacher. He's going to make sense to you. And he's going to remind you. I think about that. He's going to remind you of the things I've told you. Well, that's where the Gospels came from. That was the Holy Spirit reminding the guys of what Jesus had said, and so they could write it down. And he's going to teach them things. Well, that's where the epistles have come from. You know, Paul and Peter and John and Jude writing us stuff. The Holy Spirit explaining things and them writing it down and sending it. That's where the... That's where the whole New Testament came from. The Holy Spirit coming, teaching us things and helping us to understand. I wonder if as, as he was teaching them and reminding them and they were understanding and writing it down and they got to the part where Jesus threw his hands up and said, how much longer do I have to put up with you guys? I wonder if they got a little chuckle out of that, realizing how dense they had been until the Holy Spirit came and taught them 
No, we're going to skip from 27 all the way into 15, chapter 15, all the way to 1526. Not because that stuff isn't fantastic. That is some of the best stuff in the New Testament. It's just we only have so much time, and we're not going to get into that today. That is the section that talks about us dwelling with Him and remaining with Him, about the Father's love for us and our love for one another, the fact that the world will not love us. In fact, they will hate the one who is in communication with Christ. That's that, that's that whole section. 26 of 15 says, When the Counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. Now, I want to just take a look at a couple of things in that verse. First of all, that term, Counselor. That's a really great term. It's the term parakletos. You know that term, counselor. You know what I think of when I think of the term counselor? I think of Perry Mason. I've mentioned before that's a favorite show of mine, and it's one of the few TV shows I think you can sit and watch without becoming morally corrupt. Perry Mason, what a great show. You know, Hamilton Berger, the defense or the uh, prosecuting attorney, always refers to him as counselor. That's great. What do you want to do, counselor? You're going to... You're going to cross-examine this guy, counselor? He always said, that's a great counselor. Because I've thought about that. Because these people that are always innocent, by the way, are on trial for their life. And they have absolutely no idea what to do. And so they go to Perry Mason and they spill the beans, man. They tell him everything. And every now and then, one of them tries to withhold stuff, but he figures it out and comes and gets it out of him. He's got to know everything. And once he knows everything... He can stand beside them and say, I honestly know everything there is to know about this person and I know that they're innocent of this crime. He can tell them what they need to do. Here is exactly what I need you to do and say. And he's told people, write letters, go places, check into this hotel. I've heard him tell people. He tells them exactly what they need to do. He's a very comforting force. Oh, how many times someone is charged with the ultimate crime and they find out that Perry Mason is their attorney and they (sighs) breathe deeply because they know they'll be just fine. He is the counselor. That's, in a certain way, what the Holy Spirit is for us. We are being continuously charged by Satan. As a matter of fact, his name, Hasatan, means the accuser. He is continuously accusing us. But we have a defense attorney. He is our counselor. And he tells us, tell me all about it. No, 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 no. Tell me all about it. I I need to know everything that's going on. We tell him everything that's going on in our hearts. And he says, okay. And as we confess it to him, which means agree with him that it was rebellion against God, he cleanses us. That's what we read in 1 John. 1 John 1, 9, as a matter of fact tells us that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then it's gone and we are not guilty. And he stands next to us with his arm around us and says, it'll be okay. I know that you are no longer guilty. He is our counselor. Another really interesting thing about that is that Jesus says, he will testify about me. That is a pronoun indicating that this is a person we are discussing. He does not say it. So many people think of the Holy Spirit as a great force. I can't, listen, I understand why we refer to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit, but I kind of wish we referred to the Holy Spirit as the Counselor. That would be much cooler, much easier to relate to for me. The Holy Spirit sounds like a Jedi thing. I use the Holy Spirit to open the doors at Walmart. You know, He is a person. He is the person of God who is with us, and who is in us. He has been sent from the Father, the Spirit of truth, proceeding from the Father, and His job is to testify about Christ. Christ was continuously pointing to Father God. The Holy Spirit is continuously pointing to Christ. And since He is in you and with you, since He is empowering you, you also will testify because you have been with me from the beginning. He is the one that is empowering us. Do you ever get behind one of those Mercedes that's been converted to biodiesel? You can always tell. First of all, you can tell because they put bumper stickers all over the back. This is converted. It's right next to their coexist and their visualized world peas bumper sticker. There's one that says, but if, even if you didn't have that bumper sticker, you could tell. 
because it smells like biodiesel the whole time it's running. Yeah, it smells like it's, yeah, it smells like burnt French fries the whole time that it's running. You can just tell it just reeks of biodiesel. That's what's powering it. Well, if we're powered by the Holy Spirit, then we will reek of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job is to tell about Jesus, to point at Jesus, to bring glory to Jesus. That's what we're going to do if we are empowered by Him. Now, 16.1 says, I have told you these things to keep you from stumbling. We talked about that. He wants us to know what's coming so we're ready. They will ban you from the synagogues, will be kicked out of society. The time will come when anyone who kills you will think he's offering service to God. That's happening now. They will do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. We talked about that a minute ago. But I have told you these things so that when their time comes, you will remember that I told them to you. You'll be reminded by the Holy Spirit. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. He was there protecting them. They didn't need to know it. But now that I'm going away to him who sent me, Oh, pardon me. But now I am going away to him who sent me. And not one of you asks, where are you going? Wendy and I were talking about this just the other day. That seems kind of crazy because didn't they just ask him where he was going? And not one of you says where he was going. I really had to look into that. I just, I've long thought that was the craziest statement. Here is what the statement means. Previously, when they asked him about the fact that he was leaving them, they were asking on their behalf. They were concerned about them. You're leaving? What will happen to us? He is indicating here, not one of you has asked, what's going to happen to you? He said, I've told you that all of this stuff is going to happen to you. Not one of you has asked, what's going to happen to me? Yet, because I have spoken these things, sorrow has filled your heart. You feel like you are going to be abandoned, and therefore, you're sorrowful. You're not sorrowful about what's about to happen to me. That might come later. But for now, you are sorrowful because you feel like you're going to be completely on your own. But that's just not the case, he says in verse 7. I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. It is for your benefit. I took a minute and just read through 14, 15, and 16. And made a list of the things that Jesus tells us that the counselor will do for us. Here is just just a list of just in this section. He will comfort us. He will be with us. He will be in us. He will reveal Christ to us. He will teach us all things. He will remind us of what we've learned from Christ and about Christ. He will bring the peace and be the peace promised by Christ. He will remain with us, just hanging out with us, dwelling with us. He will empower us to remain with Him. He will deliver to us those things we ask for in Jesus' name. He will commune with us, that is, be in a constant state of conversation with us. He will tell us or testify about Christ. And He will turn our sorrow into joy. Ultimately, Summed up, he will empower us to be disciples of Christ, living that real abundant life, being a new creation, and waiting on him. That's pretty much it, isn't it? I mean, that's pretty much what the Christian life is all about. Knowing what truth is, living in that truth, being empowered by that truth, having it transform our lives, finding our joy in it. That all comes from the Counselor the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if I don't go, you're not going to have that. Now, I can see how difficult that would be if I'm sitting there with Christ, with Jesus. I want to be with him continuously, but he says, no, it's going to be even better. I mean, we can have a conversation until we both go take a nap, but, he says, the counselor will be this continuous state of dwelling with you in communion, bringing you comfort and peace from the inside out, That's what He will do for you. That's why you need Him. That's why it will be to your benefit. But you got to understand, the world is not going to appreciate that. He already told us the world will not like Him because it doesn't see Him. 
But part of what we skipped says in verse 15, 18, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before you. Wow. This isn't going to be good. We're going to be banned from the synagogues, kicked out of society. People are going to kill us and think they're offering a surface to God. That doesn't sound real good. Yeah, they're not going to like the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you why. For us, He will empower us to be disciples of Christ, living the abundant life that He's promised, this new creation kind of life, waiting on Him and waiting for Him, being in a state of communion with Him. But to the world, verse 8, when He comes, He will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. He will convict them. That is, He will let them know that He knows the truth about them, he will convince them that, they, that this is the truth about them. And it will come with a measure of condemnation. That a result of the truth about them, they're going to face condemnation. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Verse 9. About sin, because they do not believe in me. Now, you hear, oh, God's going to convict the world of sin. Yippee, woohoo, there are a bunch of sinners they all need to be convicted of sin. What we need is more fire and brimstone preaching. Preacher, tell them about their sin. Well, the Holy Spirit convicts them of one sin. Did you catch that? One sin. Just, just one. Because they do not believe in me. Now pause for a moment. We as Christians are often convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit. And we believe. What's going on with that? He only convicts them of one sin, but he can convict us of anything? Well, to a certain extent, and here's why. Because God has called us to be holy as he is holy. He is ever leading us on the road of sanctification, of holiness, of being fully surrendered to him. And if we want to be fully surrendered to him, we need some help. It is a process. It requires power that we don't have. And if we come to him and say, Lord, I want to be 100% completely and totally yours. I want to be fully submitted to you. He says, okay, let me help you with that. First of all, you're going to have to quit being submitted to some other things. Don't you remember the analogy? When you get saved, Jesus comes and opens the door of your heart, enters your house. He's there in the entryway, and you say, welcome to my home that is my heart, Jesus. And he says, great, let's go in the front room. And you're like, ooh, the front room. Well, I haven't, I haven't really cleaned that up for you yet. He says, that's right, I'll, I'll come and help. And he comes in, and he helps clean up the things in the front room of your life. And then he says, hey, let's go in the kitchen. <gasps> ooh, just don't open the fridge. There's some stuff in there that I haven't really cleaned up for you yet. Nope, I'm here to help. I'm here to help. And he opens the fridge and he sees some of that stuff and he says, hey, we both know you probably, probably shouldn't have this. This draws your attention away from me. Yep, yep, and he helps you get rid of it. Oh, well, let's go on in the bedroom. Oh, not the bedroom. Yep, let's go on in because there's some stuff in there that's drawing your attention away from me and you said you wanted to be fully submitted to me. And he goes through your entire heart in that way and helps you get rid of the things that are drawing your attention away from, that are, that are causing you to be distracted. Now, are these things open rebellion against him? Sometimes. Sometimes they are things you are choosing in spite of what you know is right. Sometimes they are things where you're just missing the mark. You're just not getting it right. And he comes to help you get it right so that you can be fully submitted to Him, so you can be 100% His. That's part of what the Holy Spirit does for you. The believer has a totally different flavor than what He's doing for the sinner, for the one who is in the world. In you, He is saying, I'm going to help you live the new creation kind of life. For them, He is saying, get it right or die. Very different flavor. He is convicting the world about sin, and the sin he is convicting them about is only one sin that they do not believe in him. Now, we can go back to Genesis chapter 3 and do a quick study one more time and see just what exactly it was that Adam and Eve did 
and you'll find that they didn't believe God. Did God really say that? Well, now that you mention it, we don't know. Matthew 12, 31. Therefore I tell you, people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy except one. People will be forgiven. John has, has been known to say more than once that when Jesus died on the cross, he forgave all of the sins of mankind. He paid the price for all of them. But there is one that remains that must be dealt with. Now, he has paid the price, but we need to be forgiven of it. And he calls it, in Matthew 12, blasphemy against the Spirit. Okay, what does the Spirit do? We just talked about this. The Spirit testifies about Christ. What's the Spirit say about Christ? Well, that He's the one and only Son of God, all-powerful, omniscient, died for your sins, rose again on the third day. All the stuff we talk about Jesus. That's what the Spirit says. Blasphemy means to speak against the fame, literally, is what it literally means in Greek. To speak against, to say, no, that's not the case. So to say, no, it's not the case that Jesus died for my sins. No, it's not the case that he lives again so that I can have new life. That is the one sin that will condemn. When people know that there is, in fact, Christ, who did, in fact, do this work, and say, well, did he really? Because I think there's a whole other thing. I think there's a whole other way we could do this. I think there's a whole other way that we could be saved. Maybe it's by following another religious leader, or maybe it's by following a legalistic system. There's a whole other way. Well, that's the sin that they'll be convicted about. That's the sin that the Holy Spirit will work to convict them about. The one that's most popular in our society today is it's just not that serious. It's just not that serious. You don't, you don't really need to go to Christ for forgiveness. It's just not that serious. You're just fine just the way you are. It's just not that serious. Well, you'll be convicted about that. Convicted because only Christ can save. There is no one else who can save. Everyone needs to be saved by Christ. If your name is not written in the book of life that Jesus owns, that he wrote, then you're in bad shape. The Holy Spirit will convict them about sin because they do not believe in Christ and about righteousness because I am going to the Father. Oh, wait, I missed this part, and this is a good part. We like to tell sinners that they're sinners, don't we? We like to tell them that they need to clean up their behavior, that they need to change their moral actions. We like to tell them that. We like to tell them when they're being bad, don't we? The Holy Spirit does not. Imagine if we took all of our efforts in trying to make sinners be like us, and instead of telling them to knock off the smoking and drinking and partying and stealing and embezzling and whatever, instead of telling them they need to behave like Christians, what if instead we just went to them and told them that they need to trust Christ? What if we took all of the efforts that we spend telling people to behave better and instead put all of those efforts into just glorifying Christ before them? Do you think we might be more effective? That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what He has decided to do. Is to instead of telling them, hey, knock off that smoking. Instead, He tells them, let me tell you about Christ. You really need to know because you're lost without Him. Interesting concept. Verse 10, about righteousness. Because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me. You know Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. What you earn for your rebelling is dying. The wages of sin is death. What you earn and I earn and we all earn from, for our unrighteousness is dying. This is why we are always trying to reverse this. This is why we are trying to live longer and longer. 
because dying is coming. This is why we are always trying to clean up our act, because we know that because of our act, we face impending doom. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will convict people about righteousness. That is, he will help them to understand that they are not righteous, those of the world, because he is going to the Father. And you will no longer see me. He will still be alive. He just won't be here anymore. Think about this for a moment. What happened to Muhammad? Do you know? On January 8th, 632, he got sick and died. He just, he just got sick. He, just, he got it like a cold or something. Not like a really bad sickness, but he was kind of getting old and weak. And it just took him down. If they'd had penicillin or whatever, he might have lived a little longer. But he just, like any other man, his body is buried in Medina, Saudi Arabia. You and I can't go see it. We're not Muslims. We could, we could look on the news or on the website. Yep, there he is, dead. Still there? Pr- pretty, pretty much dead. What happened to Confucius? You know, the Confucius. The, uh, man, my mouth is bad tonight. What happened to Confucius? I gave him a new name. That's the TRE version. He was a major Chinese thinker and leader and religious master. Yeah, he died. He was either 71 or 72. I don't know exactly because I don't know exactly when his birthday was. But yeah, he got old and he got sick and he just, he just died. What about Buddha? He was 80 years old. He ate dinner that consisted of some meat and some mushrooms, and apparently something was bad in it because he got food poisoning from it, and he died. What happened to Jesus? Well, he died too. Wait a minute. Did he get old and sick and weak and die? No. No. Some, somebody killed him. A, a group of people killed him. We, we know that. But we also know he didn't stay dead. That's just the weirdest thing of the whole deal. You can actually go to his tomb today. It's, 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 in, it's in Israel. It's kind of part of Jerusalem now, but it used to be outside of it. You can go there, and he ain't there. I mean, they know that's his tomb, but he's not in there. He, he, he rose. They found, it, they found the tomb empty on Sunday morning. By Sunday afternoon, everybody knew he was still alive. He appeared to a whole bunch of people over the course of the next 40 days. And we have this incontrovertible, incontroversial, I can't say the word, we have evidence that can't be shot down that he is still alive today. Why did he not? Why did Buddha die and Jesus not stay dead? Because the wages of sin is death. What you earn for your unrighteousness is you die. When the Spirit comes, He's going to convict the world about their lack of righteousness because I am still alive and they're heading to death. Get it? And one other thing. About judgment. Verse 11. Because the ruler of this world has been judged. Who is the ruler of this world? Well, it's Satan. The world was handed over to him. Jesus bought it back with his death and resurrection, which is pending as, as, as of this conversation. Yep, the ruler of the world is Satan. But he has been judged. What we experience today is just... You ever seen an, an alligator get caught? They're going to kill an alligator? That thing thrashes around like crazy as it's dying. Yeah, exactly. Thrashes around like crazy as it's dying. That's what we're getting here today is Satan thrashing around like crazy. Yep. But, but, Acts chapter 2 tells us, let the whole house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's in charge of the whole thing. The ruler has been judged. The system of the world has been judged. It has been found wanting and lacking 
It has been shot down, and it's going down in flames, and everybody knows it. You go out there and start asking people, are things getting better or are things getting worse? Oh, they're getting worse. They're getting worse. Things are getting worse. Yep. Yep. The world has been judged. John 16, 12. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. For He won't speak on His own, but He will speak whatever He hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. That's, that's the power. The Spirit of truth in us, that's the power. When Jesus went to ascend back to the Father, Matthew tells us in Matthew 28, He made this statement. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Did you ever think about that? What a ludicrous thing to say. I mean, imagine if one of our esteemed presidential candidates stood up on a soapbox with a microphone with the sleeves rolled up, because that's how they do it now. And he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We wouldn't even vote for that guy. He's nuts. Unless it was true. Jesus stood up and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's in charge of it all. He has all the power. And what he is doing with that power now is living in you and in me. Empowering us. I have a feeling that the amount of power that it takes to make an old loser sinner like me into somebody who's living a new creation kind of life is significantly more than 66,330 horsepower that it takes to move that ship all the way across the sea. I have a feeling it's a lot more than that. I do know that when I, you know, put the power out, I crash. But when I am living in His power, all kinds of incredible things happen. And I am made new. And that's what He has for us. That is how His plan works. That's where we see His grace. And on Sunday morning, we will finish a great discussion of the power that raised Him from the dead. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for leading us this far. I thank You for Colossians that's coming up. We're so excited to see what You have for us in that. We thank You for Easter Sunday morning and how we want, O oh Lord, to rest in You. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.